for. Um, you can scroll down past that to get to um, so sign up for our morning call, um, which will come. It's our daily newsletter that will come from Bill Bergman every day. Uh, and while you're under quarantine, uh, go to our sister website, state, I'm sorry, data-z.org. Um, there you can click on your state and see its current financial condition. Um, and also you could do that for your city. But the fun thing to do during lockdown is to create your own charts where you can compare the 50 states, compare the cities on more than 700 financial, economic, and demographic uh, data points. Uh, today's event is based upon an Illinois ballot measure that would repeal the state's constitutional requirement that the state's personal income tax is a flat rate across income. If successful, the ballot measure would allow the governor and the legislatures to enact legislation for a graduated income tax. You'll see this as the first question on your uh, November 3rd ballot. Uh, presenting vote yes side is Ralph Martiri, the executive director of the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, a think tank committed to, to ensuring that state, federal, and local workforce, education, fiscal, economic, and budget policies are fair and just and promote opportunities for all regardless of race, ethnicity, or income level. He is also the Rubloff Professor a public policy at Roosevelt University. Presenting the no side of the argument is Austin Berg of the Illinois Policy Institute, where he is the vice president of marketing. He and his work has been, fe has been featured in The Economist, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and more. He was honored as one of Chicago's 20, top 20 in their 20s uh, by Chicago Cranes Business. For today's event, everyone will get to be able to ask a question using the Q&A feature, not the chat feature. Click on the Q&A feature at the lower bottom uh, left-hand side of your screen. Uh, once you've clicked on the Q&A button, you can just type in your question and we'll try to answer it. But fortunately, we had a sold out event today, so we might not get to um, all your questions, but feel free to reach out to us afterwards if we haven't. So thank you um, to everybody for attending. Thanks for my, um, for my guest. Uh, we'll turn it first over to Ralph for about five minutes of uh, in, uh, comments and then to Austin for comments and then we'll go to your questions. Ralph, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Sheila. How are you doing? I'm tired, old and cranky as we established <laughs> earlier. All right, so we're about to have a ballot initiative to permit a graduated rate structure. To be very clear, that's all the ballot initiative does, right? It, it, we could also have a flat rate structure after this passes. So the question is whether or not we want to permit such a structure. And there is a new tax structure that would become automatically law if this ballot initiative is ratified. And that's what's called the fair tax. And that passed the General Assembly on a bipartisan basis and would go into law on January 1st of 2021. So why do we wanna do this? And, and for one real simple reason, it addresses a number of historic problems with Illinois' tax policy. Illinois historically has been one of the most unfair taxing states in the entire nation. And the reason for that is we are regressive. And that's a textbook fiscal policy definition of unfair, a regressive tax system that focuses tax burden on low and middle income families rather than affluent families, thereby ignoring ability to pay. And it's really hard to change that with tax policy. Building fairness into, into your tax system is, is a challenge because literally every tax or fee imposed at the state or local level is regressive, except for the income tax. But then the income tax can only sort of play its role of offsetting the natural regressivity of every other tax or fee if it has a progressive rate structure and can impose higher tax rates on higher levels of income and lower tax rates on lower levels of income. So this is one of the key changes that the amendment will allow is basically permit the income tax to play its core tax policy role of offsetting the natural regressivity of every other tax and fee that funds state and local government. Now, there's a, been a second problem by having a tax system that doesn't shift tax burden intentionally away from low and middle income families to more affluent families. 
And that second problem is worsening of income inequality, which has led to a third problem, and that is poor revenue generation over time. Let's talk about the second problem. In, from 1979 through 2017, the wealthiest 1% in Illinois, this is Illinois specific data, saw their incomes increase from an average of about $411,000 a year to over $1.4 million a year. It's a dramatic increase, 254% increase. And this is an inflation adjusted real terms. The bottom 99% of earners in Illinois saw their average incomes increase from 51,000 to 61,000 over the same sequence, only a $10,000 jump in real terms. And, and there is no tax that could respond to this tremendous growth in income inequality other than the income tax, because like I said, every other tax and fee, sales, excise, property, whatever, are regressive. The only tax that could respond to how incomes are actually distributed in the modern economy is uh, an income tax, and then only if it has a graduated rate structure. Having a flat rate structure then literally prohibits the income tax from doing the two things it is supposed to do if you pick up the tax policy book and read about the design of the tax system. Number one, offset the natural regressivity of every other tax and fee. And number two, respond to how income is actually distributed in the monitored economy by shifting some tax burden in accordance with ability to pay. Now, because our income tax doesn't perform this function and shift some tax burden to people at the very top of the income ladder. We focus revenue generation on low and middle income families who have had flatter declining incomes on an inflation adjusted basis for four decades. And that's had revenue impacts on the state of Illinois. And in fact, once again, looking at everything in real inflation adjusted terms in fiscal year 2020, not accounting for the impact COVID-19 had on the economy, our state general fund revenue was actually less than it was in the year 2000, two decades prior. Revenue growth simply didn't keep up with the modern economy. This year, it was finally projected to catch up to where it was in the year 2000. And what's really interesting about that we've actually increased our income tax rates over this period. So back in the year 2000, the personal income tax rate was 3%, it's now 4.95, and the corporate income tax rate was 4.8, it's now 7. Despite those rate increases, our revenue hasn't grown with the modern economy on an inflation-adjusted basis. Why? It's because our rate structure can't respond to how income is actually distributed in the modern economy, and hence we miss too much of the revenue of the income growth in the economy in the way our tax system is designed. And this in turn has generated deficit after deficit after deficit. And the proof there is in the pudding. So if you look at state expenditures on core services today, they're literally 20% lower than they were in the year 2000 under Republican Governor Ryan. We've cut spending on services because in large part, our revenue hasn't kept up with the modern economy in real terms. Now. This fair tax proposal would actually help address all these problems by raising in a non-COVID economy, I think we have to say that about everything now, Sheila, right? In the non-COVID world, in a non-COVID economy, you'd raise about 3.6 billion in new revenue and only from the wealthiest 3% and truly they could afford it. So just to give you the, the IRS data that's most recent that we have, between, between the years 2016 and 2017, the wealthiest 3% in Illinois, based on what they reported to the federal government in their, their uh, tax returns, actually saw their taxable income, not their gross income, their taxable income grow by over $16 billion in that one year sequence, 16 billion. Now, paying an additional 3 billion in taxes means that, or 3.6 even, would mean that their incomes would grow by 12 billion. I mean, it's, it's not harming them in any way. And if you actually look at what the new distribution in tax burden would be after the fair tax goes into play, low and middle income families would pay slightly less, not a lot less. It really isn't a tax cut piece of legislation. It is a revenue raising piece of legislation that shifts tax burden to the top. And tax burden to the top goes up from being the lowest in the state of Illinois to being 
lowest in the state of Illinois. Their tax burden as a percentage of income at the very top of the ladder would go up from about 7.4, 7.5% of income to about 9.4, 9.5. And that would still be the lowest tax burden as a percentage of income. In fact, everyone in the bottom 20, 40, 60, 80% pay well over 12% of their incomes in state and local taxes. At the very bottom, they're paying over 14%. So all this proposal does is utilize the income tax for its intended purposes, offset the regressivity of every other tax and fee, impose some tax burden in a manner that tracks ability to pay and corresponds to how income is distributed in the modern economy. By doing this, it helps solve some of the state's long-term revenue problems, and it does so in a way that, that readjust tax burden, we're still the wealthiest in the state have the lowest tax burdens, but it, the, the tax burden differential moderates somewhat. So it's not eliminated. We're not, we don't go from regressive to progressive overnight, but it does get slightly better and fairer. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, and now we'll turn it over to Austin for his opening comments. Thanks, Sheila. So, Everyone on this Zoom has likely heard, unless you've been living under a rock, a lot of television ads talking about fairness. You've seen the governor talking a lot about a fair tax. You've seen mailers coming to your home talking about how Illinois taxation is unfair and so you should pass the fair tax. But when you get your ballot, or perhaps when you've already gone to go uh, early vote, you'll notice that the word fair is nowhere to be found. And that's because this ballot measure has nothing to do with fairness. Illinoisans are voting on power, specifically the power, giving power to Springfield to pass new taxes and at higher rates on all Illinoisans, not just the wealthy few. As Ralph said, the rates have been passed in statute, but that's not what's being voted on. The, the rates are essentially a political promise. Illinois politicians are saying, give us this new taxing power and we, we promise we'll only soak the rich guy. The problem is Illinois batting average on, uh, on, on political promises when it comes to taxes is depending on how you see it, it's either zero or a thousand. They break every single one. They, they promised us that uh, Illinois would be toll free in 73, that we would no longer, that we would retire the debt on the toll roads and we'd no longer have to pay tolls. They promised us that lottery money would go to education. They promised us that the 1989 temporary income tax hike would not be made permanent, but it was. They promised us the 2011 tax hike would really uh, bring down our debt levels and help solve the state's fiscal crisis. It didn't. Uh, and they also promised that would be temporary. They later essentially made it permanent in 2017. And they promised getting this on the ballot that it would come with some substantial property tax relief from a task force that as of yet, um, I think it's been about 18 months, have yet to see a report from the property tax relief task force. So we should not be believing these promises that lawmakers will only go after the rich. And it's not just Illinois that breaks these promises. Other progressive tax states break the promise as well. The best example is the only state to move to this type of tax structure in the last 30 years, and that is Connecticut. They made exactly the same, prop, uh, same promises to voters that it would ease property tax bills that would provide tax relief to the middle class, but no luck. Since then, their property taxes are up 35%, middle class income taxes are up 13%. And it's not just Connecticut, 18 of the 32 progressive tax states hit the middle class with the highest possible rate. Again, a majority of progressive tax states hit the middle class at the highest marginal tax rate. And they zero in on the middle class because that's who offers the most taxable income. And, and, and why do progressive taxes make that a likelihood? We see a lot of people on the yes side saying, well, this doesn't offer any new powers. Well, it makes this more likely of tax hikes on the middle class for the same reason that when you're watching a horror movie, you plead for the group to stick together. Separation makes you vulnerable and progressive tax re regimes allow for that separation. I would like to address briefly claims that this is in any way helpful to the working poor in Illinois, I think that's insulting. This plan gives Illinoisans in the bottom 20% of the income distribution an income tax cut of a whopping $6. So perhaps they could buy a fast food meal with that, but it's not any real relief. They would be paying, stuck paying 
the highest tax burden in the Midwest for low-income workers and the third highest uh, tax burden in the nation for low-income workers. And finally, uh, the way it hurts the poor the most is it totally pours salt in the state's job engine. Uh, around 100,000 small businesses would see tax hikes of up to 47% if this passes. That's where the bulk of the new jobs in the state co come from. And currently, we're looking at about, there's new jobs numbers out uh, this morning in Illinois, but about 700,000 Illinoisans are out of work. A tax hike on businesses could not come at a worse possible time. You do not hike taxes in a recession. So in conclusion, I would like to say uh, fairness isn't on the ballot this year. Power is on the ballot, and Illinoisans should vote no to giving Springfield more taxing power. Thank you, Austin. Um, and remember that uh, each of you can ask a question, go to that uh, Q&A button at the lower left-hand side of your screen. Um, I will start with a couple of questions. Um, uh, as part of Truth in Accounting State of the States, we rank Illinois as the second worst in the nation with each taxpayer's share of the debt being $52,000. If additional tax revenue is generated from the amendment and other taxing legislation, how much of that money will be used to pay down the 226 billion dollars of debt the state already has. Uh, Ralph, if you can start with that. Sure, well, and, and this is sort of where I'm gonna depart from a couple of things Austin said in his precatory comments. So when we passed the 2011 temporary tax increase, which did phase down by law, it was replaced with an entirely new law, by the way, that was passed on a bipartisan basis in 2017. It did phase down in 2016 and 17 under Governor Rauner. So it did phase down, but in the interim period that that law was in place, let's look at what happened. It passed and went into effect in 2011. At that time, the accumulated deficit in the state's general fund was north of $16 billion. By the end of 2015, the four years it was in place, the deficit was down to $5 billion. Meanwhile, spending on current services was down as well. So they literally used all of the new money from the temporary tax increase to pay down deficit and to cover the growth in the one thing that probably Austin and I will agree on uh, that is really challenging the state's fiscal system. And that is the debt plan for repayment of what was borrowed from the pension system over the last 40 years. This repayment plan has so backloaded uh, the, the debt service part that if, if you break down what the annual payments are under our pension system, uh, last year it was about 9 billion in total, just under, but of that 9 billion, only about 2.8 was the actual normal cost of funding benefits. The remaining payment was the debt service payment. And, and this was the debt service plan tax in 1995 as part of the pension ramp, which grows every single year hereafter at unaffordable, unattainable rates. And so what they're going to have to do is get that debt ramp reamortized in a way that grows the funded ratio of the pension systems responsibly every single year. No more, no more kicking the can down the road, grow your funded ratio, but pay off your debt at a level that you could afford. And just to emphasize how unaffordable this ramp is between fiscal years 2020 and 2021, the debt service component increased by over 500 million while the normal cost of funding benefits went down uh, marginally by a million or two, not a lot, but it went down. The, the debt service grew by 500 million. Total general fund revenue was 100 million. Debt service grew by five times the rate of growth in revenue. So, you know, the bottom line is the state has recently been much more responsible with how it's handled new revenue. It's used it to pay down debt. It got it down to a level where it was almost at the acceptable level. You'd always have about $2 billion, $2.5 billion, given the size of our general fund, carry forward deficit from one year to the next in unpaid bills just because of the timing of the bill cycle. Uh, and that's not bad. That's what most states see. Uh, but the bottom line is we got it down to five from 16. And then what happened? Temporary tax increase phased out under Governor Rauner in his first two years. So the top rate went, the income tax rate went from 5% to 3.75%. Our revenue fell off the charts again, deficits exploded again. And literally, when they passed that new tax rate of 4.95% that they passed in 2017, the deficit had grown in two years from 5 billion to over 12 under Governor Rauner, primarily because of a lack of revenue. 
So if you actually look at what they've done, uh, they've been far more responsible recently. And under Governor Pritzker, uh, he did increase spending a little bit his first year in office, but he did raise the revenue to cover every penny of additional spending. This is new. Governors don't tend to do that, right? They tend to just spend without caring about whether or not there's revenue to, to, to support it. No, he cared. Uh, he is pushing for establishment of a real rainy day fund. Illinois does not have a real rainy day fund. So I think, you know, we have to just deal with the fact that our revenue system doesn't work in or comport to the modern economy. Um, ahead, and and Ralph, this is one way to do it. And they've been responsible in paying down the debt. Ralph, going back to, um, am I still maybe? No. Um, going back to my question was that if this raises revenue, will that revenue be used to pay off the pensions and pay off the debt? That's already been accumulated. And actually, that, that's, be Sheila, I just said that's what they did with the revenue from the temporary tax increase. They all they did was pay pension debt growth and accumulated deficit growth in their general fund. They paid down back due bills. So of and course they will. That's their track record. But that's not going to be enough. I mean, and so uh, some of the critics of the fair tax claim it doesn't raise enough revenue to solve all your problems. And that's true. It's an important part of solving the problems. It doesn't raise enough revenue to solve it all. No one, no one believes the appropriate thing to do is to tax your way completely out of this problem. You want to get your tax system to work and design well in a modern economy. This does that. But then the pension ramp, which is really the debt that's crushing the state, needs to be re-amortized. And the solution to that, uh, you can find on our website, which we actually grow the funded ratio faster than the current ramp, get the system healthier, and save about $42, 46000000000 billion in taxpayer costs between now and the end of the ramp. So the bottom line is there are other things the state needs to do to totally resolve its unfunded pension liability that are responsible, that are doable, that are constitutional. This re new revenue though, I think we could have the confidence will be used primarily for the two things the new revenue was used during the temporary tax increase, paying down accumulated debt in the general fund and paying the growth in the pension debt. That's what it was uh, used for. Austin, uh, your, your response, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever heard Illinois track record as described as one of paying down its debts, but this none of this new money is earmarked for any debt payments. J.B. Pritzker promises around 100 to 200 million dollars going into the pension systems. That is, you couldn't even describe that as a drop in the bucket. It does absolutely nothing to address Illinois' debt crisis. And that's why we're worried that this leads to middle class tax hikes, because that debt is going to continue growing rapidly uh, and, and Pritzker shown no willingness to, to tackle that. Again, no, no money here is earmarked for paying down Illinois' debt. Uh, uh, and Austin, uh, to go to the next, uh, the first audience question, which is, can't Illinois already raise taxes on everybody and can't Illinois already um, tax retirement income? Illinois can and has uh, raised taxes on everybody, yes, but it comes at an extraordinary political cost. So in 2017, when lawmakers raised the income tax, about one in three lawmakers either decided not to run or lost their races. So back to the horror movie analogy, you wanna to stick together because there's strength in numbers. Without that strength in numbers, they can pick off whatever income groups they want and, and have those rackets creep down, which is exactly what we've seen in other states. In terms of the retirement tax, you don't need to take my word for it. Just take Illinois Treasurer Mike Frerich's word for it or Deputy Governor Christian Mitchell's word for it. Uh, or, or a number of other uh, leaders in J.B. Pritzker's administration, including his, his revenue director, David Harris, they all, they all know a progressive and have said a progressive tax makes retirement taxes easier, uh, easier to get through the legislature. And it's because you can start off with a completely different rate that's not possible under the current uh, constitution. You would have to tax all retirement income at the same rate that everybody else is taxed. That's an enormous political hurdle. But with this, you can start uh, with, say, a penny tax on retirement income over $50,000 or uh, establish a whole new set of brackets for retirement income. It's much politically easier to do. And, and Mike Frerich said this summer that having a graduated income tax will make it clear that you can tax uh, retirement income at graduated rates. And, and a key point there is of the 32 states with progressive taxes, all 32 tax retirement income in some form. And you should not be trusting Illinois lawmakers who say we would be any different. Any response, 
Oh yeah, a lot. So first of all, the easy answer to the question is no. Keep it short. <laughs> yeah, no. The easy answer is no. And and when I had a discussion on this against wire points and AEI, they both admitted the amendment creates absolutely no legal authority or power whatsoever to tax retirement income or tax people that doesn't exist today. So that's number one. It just doesn't. That's a scare tactic. Number two, the AARP which is totally against ever taxing retirement income as one of its core principles supports the fair tax. Why would they support the fair tax if it made taxing retirement income more like it? They wouldn't, it just doesn't even make logical sense. Uh, and, and number three, you know, we are one of only three states, whether they have a flat tax or a graduated rate structure that doesn't tax retirement income out of the 41 states with, a, with an income tax. It's us, Pennsylvania and Mississippi. And so the bottom line is most states tax retirement income, as does the federal government. Illinois won't. Governor Pritzker made it entirely clear he's against it. He has said that publicly. Freyrich's was simply wrong. I mean, if they wanted to, and this is the truth, if they wanted to tax retirement income today with no amendment on a progressive basis, they could do it. Why? It's a deduction. So the way retirement income isn't taxed today is you get to deduct all your retirement income, not that you're retired, Sheila, but all your retirement income from your AGI, your adjusted gross income. So they could say, you can now only deduct the first 50,000 of your retirement income. Suddenly, right away today, they've created a progressive approach to taxing retirement income. It doesn't make it easier. That's, that's a scare tactic. And, and nothing in, in this either legislation that creates the fair tax rate structure nor in the amendment make it easier to tax people generally or to tax retirement income, number one. But number two, if you're worried about taxing the income, the middle class with your income tax, and you want to find a way to avoid that, you need a graduated rate structure. Otherwise, every tax increase, the income tax has to hit the middle class, has to, can't avoid it. The only way to avoid it is with a graduated rate structure. Yeah, so the next audience question would be, uh, what will the state's course of action be if, it, if the amendment doesn't pass? Uh, will the flat tax be raised again? Uh, Ralph? I'll be first. <laughs> We're alternating, Austin. You get to go next. Uh, yeah, the answer is I believe it will. And, and, I, and you think a one percentage point increase from 4.95% to 5.95% would probably be likely. Why do I say that? Uh, that generates about $3.4 billion in net revenue after the refund fund. So it about replaces the, the net revenue after the refund fund that the fair tax would generate. Uh, unfortunately, if we did that, it would disproportionately impact low and moderate income families. And, and that's, that's just un unfortunate given the tremendous growth in income inequality we've realized in our state of Illinois. And we just need this very important tax policy tool in the kit. Once again, you pick up a textbook on tax policy, you're supposed to use your income tax to do two things, offset the regressivity of every other tax and fee and respond to how incomes, you know, actually distributed in the modern economy. We can't do that with our income tax because we're required to impose it as a flat rate. We need this tool in the kit. It's the only way to avoid taxing low and moderate income families more through the income tax. Uh, Austin? So uh, Ralph mentioned scare tactics before. I think this is another one. If, if you don't pass my tax amendment, we're gonna hike taxes on all of you, whether you like it or not. I think that's going to be very politically unpopular, especially for lawmakers who are going to be up for reelection in another two years, and especially for a governor who's gonna be up for reelection in two years. This is the protection that we have with the flat tax rate. It is so politically unpopular to raise the income tax on everybody. And, and I think that would be prevented yet again. Uh, if it goes down, I think there needs there is finally going to be a realistic discussion about addressing Illinois' vast overspending problem on pensions in particular. Uh, and it's, it's just extraordinary inefficiency in government, especially at the local level or proliferation of thousands of units of local government. Well, I mean, we'll be forced to actually have a serious conversation about addressing those things for once, rather than going back to taxpayers again and again and again. Um, and then Austin, uh, you'll answer the next question first, which is what do the other states experience suggest about whether the new tax structure will have an impact on out, out migration of population and jobs? That's a really good question. There's a lots of uh, really large body of research on this. 
I, I think it's very important to recognize that Illinoisans leaving the state now who say to pollsters they want to leave the state list high taxes as the number one reason why they do want to leave. The real uh, interaction here is one of economic growth and migration. People really move for economic opportunity. And the way that this tax hike affects migration is the fact that it kills economic opportunity for so many because it really goes after so many small businesses, which as I said before, are the state's jobs engine. That is particularly bad to do as President Barack Obama has said, as his top advisor, Christina Romer has written uh, uh, many times that, that you do not want to hike taxes in a recession because it really, really kill. We are talking about inequality. I mean, the, it kills these jo job opportunities, especially for people at the lower end of the income distribution. And that, of, that is definitely going to drive migration decisions, whether that's on the inflow side or the outflow side in terms of Illinois lacking economic opportunity. And that's why every single business group in the state is against this. Uh, Ralph? So all the peer reviewed research, all of it shows there's no statistically meaningful correlation between tax policy and migration. But let me just give you some Illinois specific data. Out migration from Illinois over the last 20, 10 years, from 2010 forward, 1.6 million people moved out of Illinois into states with higher income tax rates than Illinois. And over that same period of time, 1.2 million or fewer Illinoisans, a statistically meaningful fewer number of Illinoisans, moved to states that either have lower income tax rates than Illinois or no income taxes like Florida and Texas. More moved to the high tax states, moved to the lower tax states. Now some more Illinois specific data. We talked about the temporary tax increase. When that temporary tax increase went into effect in Illinois, guess what happened? Out migration in, uh, from Illinois slowed down. And in fact, when did out migration reach its highest levels in the last 10, 20 years and peak? It was during the two years under Governor Rauner when the temporary tax increase was allowed to phase down and the top rate went from 3% to 5% to 3.75%. In other words, taxes were lower. Then in 2017, when the tax rate was increased again, the out-migration rate slowed down again. Look, there's just no statistically meaningful correlation between out-migration and, and tax policy. Other things matter more. And the people leaving Illinois are low to middle income families because they can't find jobs in our state. But I, but I gotta say, you know, Austin has twice indicated that a tax increase during a recession is bad policy, and, and he's just wrong. And so I'm going I'm to go on, on Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz, who looked at what happened to the economies of state governments coming out of the Great Recession. And what he specifically found was those state governments that went to an austerity approach and cut spending on core services slowed their recovery and worsened the length of the Great Recession and its impact on those states. Whereas those states that actually raised taxes progressively like the fair tax does and invested that expended those new revenues in spending on core services where nine out of $10 go to education, health, social services and public safety, every single one of them recovered faster and grew their economy faster. Now, why would that be? And it all comes down to consumer spending. So 67% of the economy is consumer spending. When you raise taxes on the wealthiest, they don't reduce their consumer spending. They have a very low marginal propensity to consume. Think about their growth in income in Illinois of $16 billion in just that one year from 2016 to 2017. They're not going to spend less. They have all the disposable income they want to spend. So when you tax them more to raise some revenue and invested in spending on services, what are you really spending on? You're spending on the wages of the teachers and the social workers and the healthcare providers and the correctional officers who provide these services. In other words, middle income families who have high marginal propensities to consume and take every dollar you spend on their wage and, and invested in their local economy buying groceries and dry cleaning and all that other stuff. In other words, a net positive economic multiplier from this whole transaction to your private sector economy of anywhere of a, a, a buck to a buck 50 for every dollar in taxes you raise and spend. Similar multipliers were found by Republican PhD economist Mark Zandi, who's the principal economist at Moody's, who looked at fiscal actions 
austerity versus tax increases over the last 30 years and found that those tax increases that were progressive and were spent on services had net positive multipliers of anywhere from $1.36 to $1.53 per dollar. Mm -hmm. And those tax spending cuts had a similar negative impact. So Austin's just got that wrong. Um, Austin, uh, do you have that wrong? No, and, and the logical conclusion of Ralph's remarks is that tax hikes don't change any behavior. They don't affect jobs growth. They don't affect migration. They don't affect anything. And if that's true, I think we shouldn't stop at a top rate of you know 7.99% in Illinois. I think we should go 20, 30, 40, 50% income tax rates for those folks because it has no effect on their behavior and that money is simply there for the taking. Uh, it's just ridiculous. I can't believe that there are people who think that tax hikes don't don't affect economic behavior, and it flies in the face of the of the economic peer reviewed evidence. Number one, I didn't term. say it doesn't affect economic be or behavior. What I did say was designing your tax increase the right way that is progressive during a recession helps, and that's not me talking. This the Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz, who did the actual modeling based on what really happened okay. I mean, during Ed, the Great Recession, and Mark Zandi, the top, top economist, wait, wait a minute, and, and, and Mark Zandi, the top economist. And in fact, if you look at the, the federal income tax rates, there is no statistically meaningful correlation between high rates and low rates at the federal level, because we've messed those around a lot more. The top marginal rate at the federal level at one point post-World War II was 91%. And, and it's now been all the way down to 35% at the top rate. What has happened? No statistically meaningful correlation between the changes in these rates and changes in GDP growth, none. So where you can actually impact behavior, and I was getting into it with marginal propensity to consume, you overtax low and middle income families like we do currently in Illinois, that harms yep. your private sector and they would still economy pay among the because it takes money out of their pockets taxes. that they otherwise would be spending because they have high marginal propensities to consume. So that's bad tax policy that negatively mm -hmm. impacts your economy. So they're, they're, you don't mischaracterize what I said. What I said was this type of tax increase in this environment makes sense when you look at marginal propensity to consume and what has actually happened, not theoretically might happen, what has actually happened in America in response to the Great Recession specifically and over the last 30 years, according to Mark Zandi generally. Um, so obviously we have a, a difference of opinion here. Um, so let's go on to another question. I'm sure we won't have a disagreement on this one. Um, why are the rates um, like, I think it's 7.99 or, um, you know, seven, why do they involve like 0.9 pricing? Um, it it kind of, it kind of reminds the uh, audience member um, of a used car salesman who prices cars at like, you know, $3,999. Um, Actually, Sheila, I think was, Austin and I might agree here. That's political. <laughs> um, but it really should be, you know, it should be, you know, instead of saying 7.9, uh, 7.995, I shouldn't just be 8%. Yeah. Yeah. R Ralph said it right. It's political. And uh, I would trust them about as much as the rates that you get on your introductory cable package. Um, and I think it speaks to sort of the slapdash nature, nature of the way that these rates and these structures were put together generally. If we're going by textbook tax policy, you'd want to have them adjusted for inflation. You wouldn't want to impose a marriage penalty as these do. There's a lot of textbook mistakes in the way that these were written. Um, and, and yeah, I think the, the rate speaks to the political nature of this rather than the, um, the textbook nature of the, of the tax. Yeah, I, 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 agree. I agree with a lot of that, Sheila. I do think it was a very political uh, choice to have a 7.99 right i mean that's that's clearly done for a political reason but i don't think the rates were quite as slapdash as austin does i mean i think they did do a little backwards reasoning though they looked at how much money they felt they needed to raise from their income tax and found a rate structure that raised it while imposing the entire tax increase on the wealthiest three percent and so they that's how they designed their rate structure i don't think there's any mystery to it. I, I think it was what rate structure cuts taxes for 97% of the state raises 3.6 billion, but does it only from the wealthiest 3%. This is what they hit on. They could have hit on other rate structures that did that, but there were some politics involved in it too. And I, and I do think that that's what drove that process. Um, and uh, Rob, isn't, uh, couldn't, you know, instead of opening up the constitution um, to uh, make, you know, this huge change and to give, um, 
uh, the legislators this additional power to, to uh, raise taxes on a limited number of people. Uh, couldn't you um, couldn't you get uh, progressivity? I think that would be the word um, out of you know adjusting the um, deductions, um, exemptions, and all of that. Um, you could, of... but it's far more it's far more difficult, Sheila. Number one, and 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 while you might be able to get a little progressivity, what you don't get is the new revenue. And and I think. It's probably a second place Austin and I will agree uh, that this this legislation, the fair tax legislation, was designed to be a revenue raising piece of legislation. That was its main intent. So you, you don't get the revenue increase by, by, by just playing around with deductions and stuff. Actually, you lose revenue. And Illinois just is not in a position where it could afford to lose revenue. We we currently have an accumulated deficit of about eight point four billion in a in a general fund that has 42 billion in revenue, although 5 billion of that's loan proceeds well, this year. You, so we can't lose... afford the revenue loss. So you need the tax increase. And so the idea was, how do you raise taxes in a way that doesn't increase the burden on low and middle income families and focuses it on, and comports the new tax increase with ability to pay and focuses on the wealthiest 3%. So that's what they did. Well, couldn't Very briefly, you then go raise ahead, the, could you raise the taxes um, overall and then with the exemption, you know, to offset the exemption. Yeah, it's, it's a lot trickier, and you might might have to end up with a lot higher rate. It's 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 a it's much better utilization from a tax policy standpoint of a graduated rate structure to accomplish this directly, and it's it's more transparent, really, what you're doing. You're saying, look, we're focusing these new taxes on these tranches of taxable income over these levels so everyone could see it. So I think that's a better way to go about it, number one. And number two, if you once again had a tax policy textbook, it's literally what you're supposed to do with the design of your income. So uh, I, one I point on that, uh, one point on that, Sheila, I think it, it, this is a very important question. And I, I love that we're talking about on the truth and accounting panel, because this is very, this is the wonky stuff that I don't get to talk about in the interviews about the fair tax. But but our current flat tax is is graduated effectively. So the effective income tax rate of the bottom 20% of people is less than half of the effective tax rate as the top 20% of people. So there are ways to make our existing tax system graduated and to limit the damage on poor Illinoisans if you're going to hike the income tax. Uh, but it's, And you don't have to change the constitution in order to do that. What they're doing here is unlocking the constitution and what we're worried about there is the effect ultimately on middle-class Illinoisans and small businesses. Um, and then the next, another audience question is, how realistic is the revenue projection for the graduated um, income tax slash fair tax uh, legislation that they, is it, um, is it a dynamic projection? So i.e. if, you know, Austin's um, prediction that people will leave the state comes tr true, um, does it take that into account? Uh, and that, uh, Ralph, do you have a question on that? Well, yeah, I mean, and <laughs> the, the modeling that revenue did on it was a somewhat, they used a dynamic model that takes into account tax cheating, et cetera, tax evasion. Uh, I, I do have to repeat, though, there has never been a peer-reviewed study that ever has found any statistically meaningful correlation between tax policy and migration. That doesn't mean people never move for taxes. Of course they do. People move for lots of reasons. There's just not a statistically meaningful correlation. And so... The modeling itself in a normal economy would be fine, even accounting for things like tax evasion and, and additional strategies like that. Uh, but we have a COVID economy, so it certainly is going to generate less in a COVID economy, Sheila, than, than what we could anticipate, but not as much less as you would think. And the reason for that is where job destruction has occurred because of the pandemic. So the 30% of the jobs in the bottom two wage quintiles have been lost uh, since the pandemic uh, has created a recession, but only 5% of the jobs in the top wage quintile. So what this means is most of the, the job loss in the current recession is focused on low to low middle pay, wage paying jobs. Very little of it has been focused at the top. So while people at the top of the ladder are still being hurt by COVID-19 and by the pandemic, it's not nearly to the level. And our projections are, and I think revenue is pretty close to this. And I do think actually IPI is close to this too, that in a full year, 
uh, it would raise about 2.6 billion to 2.8 billion under current economic uh, circumstances. And that's just because there's been so much concentration of income growth at the very top of the ladder that our tax policy hasn't been able to respond to. So it's still going to be a, a, a net significant revenue raiser and, and one that does not impact low and middle income families. And one final point on that, you know, we look at all 32 states, which is, by the way, 76% of the states with an income tax have a graduated rate structure. We looked at all 32 states over the last few decades and to see whether or not they raised their rates to tax the middle class more. And the answer is no, they didn't. So 80% of the time, there were no change in the rate structures. 13% of the time, there were general tax cuts that, that included everybody, including the middle class. 5% of the time, there were general tax increases that included everybody, including the middle class. And 2% of the times, there were special taxes passed on the wealthy, which means if you're a middle income person and you actually lived in one of these states in America, one of the 32 that has a graduated rate structure, your chances of having any change to your tax rate were 80% not. Uh, but if there wasn't a change, you'd be more than twice as likely to have a tax cut and a tax increase. Yeah, now the um, big offender here was Connecticut. And I think Austin pointed out Connecticut is a big offender, but they're an outlier of the 32. They are not at all a standard state and they have some unique problems with the loss of the defense contracting industry in that state, uh, driving down their revenues in ways they had never anticipated. Uh, Austin? If the question's about what revenue brings in, I would say I'm roughly in line with what Ralph said. The problem is, again, the state's debts are growing far too fast, uh, and, and that makes hard nary a dent in them, and none of it is earmarked toward paying that down. So, again, the worry is it's whatever it generates, even the most optimistic projections, are not enough to tax our way out of this problem. And that's why they're this, giving them this new power is so irresponsible, because they're going to go after where the income is in Illinois. And if we want to look at other states, 18 of the 32 progressive tax states hit the middle class at the highest rate. Connecticut is the best example for us because it's the only state that's made this tax change in the last 30 years. Meanwhile, three states have moved back the other way from progressive to flat. And that's really the trend in tax policy now. So uh, Connecticut's a great example of this. They made all the same promises. We're going to make our tax system more fair. We're going to reduce property taxes. It's not going to affect economic growth. It has been dreadful for them. It's been dreadful for their economy. You can read our full report on what happened in Connecticut at uh, IllinoisPolicy.org. And Connecticut, as I will emphasize, is the outlier there and not the rule. And you look at some of the states that went from a graduated rate to a flat rate, North Carolina boasted that they were going to see all this great economic advantage uh, when they moved from a graduated rate structure to a flat rate structure. And not only didn't see it actually fell behind states with graduated rate structures in their region that they used to lead. So in economic growth and in number of jobs. I, I, growth I would capital. describe it. So, so the bottom line is. Because it's the only the, state that's done this in the last 30 years. And Illinois would join them in that outlier status okay. if we make this tax change. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, except that Illinois is doing it the right way. And so we're, we're, we're imposing rate structure that makes sense. And the difference between Illinois and Connecticut is that our core economy with the financial markets and the transportation hubs, et cetera, in, in the Chicago area and across the state and our agribusiness are in much better shape than the core economy in Connecticut, which was the defense industry, which has fallen off the map. So it, they really are apples and oranges comparisons and relying on the outlier to make the case as opposed to what happens in most of the states, the vast majority of the states with the graduated rate structure, just not really a convincing way to, to form an argument, especially when you look at the data and the evidence that is contrary to the position you are taking in most of the states. It's, it's just to, to, to say what happened in the outlier is gonna be the rule is a bit of a stretch. Um, and you know, uh, Austin, somebody is asking an, um, about California and uh, you know, will this cause um, the exodus that we're you know, seeing in California? You know, it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but in the long and or short run, it will it cause the exodus that California is experiencing? Uh, I think California is a good example. I would also point to New York Governor Cuomo, who bemoaned uh, to the heavens earlier this year, tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich, God forbid the rich leave, in his New York accent. Uh, and, and this really is the problem with giving the state capital this much power is because whenever there are tough times ahead, which Illinois is going to face many of them, 
uh, because it is not getting its debt problem under control whatsoever. It's not getting its spending problem, especially on pensions under control whatsoever, that it makes it politically easier to, to say, it's a crisis, we need more revenue. And then they're able to do that in little bits. It, they never address the core problem. Uh, and, and that's exactly, I think those states in terms of the political rhetoric around their taxation and the long-term damage that they're going to do to their economies by continuing to go uh, after businesses that are creating jobs in their state, we would see a very similar pattern here. Um, and the next question, uh, Ralph, is uh, it says that you've made a logical argument, um, but is he concerned uh, about the fact that post passage, the legislature can change the rates in a major way for the middle class? Is there any way to quote fix the proposed rates for the fair tax? Yeah, no, I mean, you can't fix the rates under current law either, and you don't want to embed rates in the Constitution. I mean, you don't, you, you want your Constitution to define broad rights, and you want legislation to uh, implement what, what, those, what those rights look like on the ground in response to what's happening in the real world. So, you know, there, there really isn't a logical way or a, a good legal way to lock those in. You can do some things. Some states have looked at like super majority requirements on changing tax rates. But once again, ties your hands uh, in circumstances where you need to uh, do something in response to major challenges, like for instance, COVID-19. You want to have the capacity to respond to that. Uh, I do want to make one comment on the California question, though, Sheila. Uh, so I'm, I'm California increased their top income tax rate on millionaires in 2013 from 10.3 percent to 13.3 percent, which is the highest rate on millionaires in the country. And in 2013, they had roughly 55, 50, 54, 55,000 uh, tax returns filed by millionaires. It grew, the number of tax returns filed by millionaires in the state of California grew every single year thereafter. So by 2017, it was about 84,000 uh, millionaires filing in the state. California hasn't seen any out exodus of millionaires. In fact, they have net migration in of millionaires annually. The one state that did see uh, uh, an increase, although it was statistically insignificant in its migration out of millionaires after passing a special millionaires tax, there is one state that saw that, was New Jersey, where the out migration rate of millionaires increased by 0.3% after they passed a millionaires tax. This is based on research done at Stanford University by uh, uh, Cristobal Young, who's the leading expert on migration, in fact, wrote a whole book called The Myth of Millionaire Migration, uh, looking at migration patterns over the last 10 years. And New Jersey is a special case because it's in that tri-state region, right, where you can be a millionaire and live in Connecticut or live in New York or live in Philadelphia. You can move out of New Jersey and still keep all your business contacts in a similar commute, et cetera, et cetera. And, and even there, which is the most likely case uh, for millionaire migration in response to tax changes on a statistically significant basis. They didn't find one. It was an increase, 0.3%, but not statistically significant. And despite that slight increase in millionaire out-migration post the increase in the tax, they, they, New Jersey, just like California, experienced net growth in millionaires every single year thereafter. So it, it, the, the role tax policy plays on migration has just been way overstated. And, and it just doesn't comport to the reality. Yeah. Uh, I'll again point back to the survey of Illinoisans who wanted to leave the state who said tax, put Texas as their number one reason. And, and I think it's irresponsible to deny the lived experience of millions of Illinoisans who are struggling under a very high tax burden. Uh, and especially when it comes to their job opportunities in the housing market. That's all and, I'd add. Uh, Austin, um, what about the concept of, um, is there any way to you know freeze the rates um, or do we you know, just have to hope and pray that the legislature doesn't change it for different, uh, different uh, you know, the middle class or other people? If they, it's a great question. And if they wanted to make it actually fair or put in protections for the middle class, they could have done that in the constitution, whether that's super majority requirements for hiking taxes or, or a, a bunch of other safeguards that could have uh, been put in place to limit the exposure that the middle class sees or retirees see. Interestingly, the first draft of the constitutional amendment that was introduced into legislature said that uh, you know the tax may be a fair tax where lower income Illinois pay a lower rate and higher income Illinois pay a higher rate. 
It also prohibited city income taxes in that original drafting. Both of those safeguards were taken out before passage. So it really is completely blowing up the constitution and, and allowing, in, in terms of this article, and, and allowing for really for Springfield to run roughshod over whatever rates they want on whatever people at whatever time. They could have put in protections, but they didn't. And since you bring up the Constitution, um, you know, I believe that you know, truth and accounting, we focus a lot that the state has a balanced budget requirement, but it goes into debt at the same time. Um, so if um, if you're gonna open up, you know, why why were not additional constitutional items that caught you know, that caused the state to get two hundred and twenty-six billion dollars in the hole, like like the pension clause, like um, the balanced budget clause. Uh, why, why wasn't there like a whole package of things um, proposed instead of um, what some people would say is the easiest thing, which is to raise taxes on a minority of uh, people, Austin? Uh, well, people. that's a great question. And I think it speaks to like, we're talking about textbook tax policy that would include something like a, a real balanced budget requirement or perhaps a spending cap that grows with the economy as many other states have. The problem is, or, or a pension amendment that would put us in line with other states in terms of what changes we're allowed to make. Uh, the truth is, or, or honestly, this goes on and on about trust in government too, right? Term limits, very popular, could have been put in the constitution. Fair maps, very popular, could have been put in the constitution. The only change that they're allowing you as Illinois voters to vote on, and we don't get to vote on very many big changes to our constitution, the only one is to give them almost unlimited power over the new ways that they can tax you. And, and I think that's insulting to Illinoisans who very rarely get a chance to voice their real opinion on real issues that matter to them. Right. Yeah, first of all, this 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 creates new no new power to tax that doesn't exist. It just doesn't. It it, it creates the opportunity for the legislature to design that task in a tax in a manner that doesn't impact low and middle income families. What that's is it. the difference between that's an it. opportunity that's all that it and does, a power? Austin, and you know that's all that it does. The what, what is no, the that's number one. Number two, to tax if you want to pass to if you want to pass a constitutional amendment, you can't have four or five or six on the ballot at a time, because frankly, none of them will pass. So if you're rational and you really believe that this constitutional amendment or that one or the third one is the one that makes the biggest change in policy that you feel is important for your state, you do them one at a time. That would be the only rational way to get them done. It's how the lockbox got passed for the road fund piece that can't be diverted, right? That, that was done, it was the only constitutional amendment on the, on the ballot. That's, that's the way you do things. So it's just a rational approach to doing this. And, and you'd, you'd have to look at what the specific language is for each of those other proposed constitutional amendments. You'd have to see if they're actually good policy or bad policy. So for instance, my organization and, and, and it has been supportive of a revenue enhancement for a while now. We feel the state of Illinois' primary problems are revenue problems. Austin's organization feels it's overspending. So we fundamentally disagree, right? And we, we point out spending is lower um, now than it was before on services by 20%. When I say before, two decades ago, et cetera, as part of the reason why we, we view it as not a spending problem. Which we, we also had, point had or near the bottom in spending on all these items, education, health, social services, public safety in the nation, despite having the sixth largest population. But our support for new revenue doesn't cover any kind of new revenue. So when Governor, then Governor Blagojevich proposed a gross receipts tax, uh, and he made his proposal to the House sitting as a committee of the whole, I was the first person who spoke after the governor and I opposed it. I opposed it because it was simply bad tax policy. So uh, it, it, the design said, so, well, we needed the revenue. That was a horrible way to raise it. So the design of all these initiatives, these, these constitutional amendments initiatives, these just really matter. Talking about them in the abstract without having one to review is difficult from my, from my standpoint, from a good government standpoint, giving you an analysis would be difficult. I will say it's rational to only put one ballot initiative on a time if you want to pass any of them. So I think that was the right decision to do. This is an important change. 
This is one that will allow us to use the income tax for its intended purposes, offsetting the regressivity of every other tax and fee and raising revenue from people who could afford it, doing so in a way that won't harm the modern economy, uh, at least as analyzed by a Nobel Prize winning economist who looked at everything over the last few years. So I think this is a really important initiative that deserves to be on a standalone. The, the right. rational way to do it maybe one by one, but the rational way to get voters to trust Springfield would have been to allow them to vote on things to get spending under control, like a balanced budget uh, requirement or a spending cap or pension reform, but instead they're going for the new money first. So I, I don't think that's that's rational. Well, anyway. Austin, well, they're going for the new money. We agree that they're going for money here. I mean, this is this is a tax increase bill. I I, I agree with that. You agree with that, and I, well, I don't disagree. Now uh, no, but they're not doing it first. They've already cut spending on services. I mean, so this is yeah, been but the they thing haven't that's cut been spending hidden. on the core drivers. Pension yeah. spending's up five hundred percent over the last it's 20 not years. It's pension which you know, spending. It's pension debt spending. Actually, oh, pension I'm, spending on benefits. Be glad to pay for debt. All and right, the normal yeah. cost of the benefits has been declining, as you well know. The only thing that's growing is the debt service, and that's based on a 1995 law that was about as irresponsible a piece of public policy as ever been passed. Okay. Well, we well, it, obviously this can go on and on and on. Um, I really appreciate um, Austin and Ralph for joining us as our experts today. Um, I hope this webinar helps you with your decision um, on. Uh, on, you know, on the ballot decision on November 3rd. Um, stay safe during these tough times. And again, uh, if you want more information about Truth and Accounting, go to truthandaccounting.org. Thank you so much for joining us.